Hi everybody, this is Joanne Manister, a blogger with Scientific American, and I'd like you to welcome to this very special Scientific American chat that uh, we are airing on the heels of uh, NASA's press conference yesterday about the ma uh, NASA's MAVEN space orbiter uh, that is expected to launch mid-November uh, to head to Mars to look at uh, the non-existent atmosphere of Mars and wonder where did it go. Uh, so I'm joined today by two uh, special guests who can uh, enlighten us about both the uh, what's going on with the orbiter and about uh, unmanned or robotic space uh, exploration in general. So first, um, I'd like to introduce you to a NASA space scientist, uh, the Maven, one of the MAVEN scientists, Nick Schneider from the University of Colorado in Boulder. He's with the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, that's a mouthful, um, and he's one of the members of the science team and I'm actually going to pull up. Uh, so he's an associate professor in the Department of Astrophysical and Planetary Sciences at the University of Colorado. Um, and he received his PhD in planetary science from the University of Arizona. His oh, research <laughs> his research interests include planetary atmospheres and planetary astronomy, uh, with one focus on the odd case of Jupiter's moon Io. He is also the lead on the imaging ultraviolet spectrograph on the upcoming MAVEN mission to Mars. He enjoys teaching at all levels and is active in efforts to improve undergraduate astronomy education. I go for that. Off the job, he enjoys exploring the outdoors with his family and figuring out how things work. So, uh, and what I have here, I'd like to show up something you've done. So you are one of the authors on this book, which I hear is in... Uh, Seventh edition, right. The Cosmic Perspective. This is a beginning astronomy textbook. Exactly. So, so welcome, Chris, or Nick, and I'm going to introduce uh, Chris right now. So, Chris Impey is um, a university distinguished professor um, at the University of Arizona. So, you guys have a connection. Uh, and he's deputy head of the astronomy department. His research interests include. Uh, observational cosmology, quasars, and distant galaxies. He has written 160 research papers and two astronomy textbooks, but you say those are online, right? Yeah, the one's repurposed. It's called Teach Astronomy, so it's up there and free. Oh, great. Um, he has won 11 teaching awards, has served as a National Science Foundation Distinguished Teaching Scholar, a Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholar, and the Carnegie Council's Arizona Professor of the Year. Um, he is former vice president of the American Astronomical Society and fellow of the AAAS. He has four popular books, actually now five, uh, The Living Cosmos, How It Ends, Talking About Life, and the one that we are referencing today called Dreams of Other Worlds, um, which is the amazing story of unmanned space exploration. So welcome, Chris. Thank you. So um, it, it's great to have you both here. Uh, before we go uh, forward in uh, news of space uh, today, uh, Chris Hadfield, Colonel Chris Hadfield from the Canadian Space Agency, who was on the ISS and returned recently. As we know, he made a big splash on social media with his images and singing and uh, his well, videos music. explaining his music. He, he uh, has published a book. It is out today. So if you <laughs> haven't gotten, you haven't heard of it, it's called An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. What Going to Space Taught Me About Ingenuity, Determination, and Being Prepared for Anything. And uh, we at Scientific American will have him as a guest on November 14th at noon. So mark that on your calendars and join us if you can for that. So let's talk a little bit about um, MAVEN before we talk about uh, unmanned space exploration in general or robotic space exploration in general. So um, there's, there's a lot of interest. So why don't, why don't we do some of the details? When is this expected to launch? Um, MAVEN is slated to launch on the afternoon of November 18th. There uh, is a, a short period every afternoon for a couple of weeks when, uh, when all the planets are aligned uh, because we have to have the Earth in the right position relative to Mars and the right rotation of the Earth so that the spacecraft will actually uh, get to Mars on time. If you ever wanted to know somebody whose life was controlled by the positions of the planets, well, that's uh, anybody trying to launch a spacecraft to, uh, to another planet. 
but not the rest of us. So what's in the paper is <laughs> right. not relevant at all. Yeah. So, um, so, and and but actually, there are several days. So you have a window of several days during. That's the right. It's it's a couple of weeks, and the main thing that happens is the planets go out of alignment. It just takes a little bit extra fuel, and fuel is precious. It, uh, it's our ability to to maneuver uh, when we get to Mars. So we really want to launch at that uh, sweet spot early in the launch window. That's, that's fantastic. I, I'm excited because I'm going down for the launch myself. The only, only other launch I've seen is the last space shuttle launch. So I was, I'm was i glad I got to see that one. So so I'm looking forward to watching an Atlas V go off. <laughs> <laughs> really quite, I'm really quite excited about this. Um, so um, as far as uh, we, we're wondering, for those of you who did not catch the press conference yesterday, what is Maven going to do? Uh, sure, I'm, I'm happy to explain that. I'm pretty sure that the, uh, uh, the members of the Hangout are going to be pretty familiar with uh, the, the basics on Mars is that uh, 100 years ago or more, uh, anybody who looked through the telescope on Mars uh, really wondered what was going on with the change of the seasons. Uh, there was actually a suspicion that there was uh, uh, life on Mars, uh, water on Mars. But uh, by the time the first NASA probes got to Mars, what they discovered instead is that the atmosphere now is, is next to nothing. There's no um, uh, flowing water or uh, evidence of, of uh, uh, abundant water on the surface. And instead, it's this really cold, uh, really dry planet. Um, and yet, you look at those images, and what you see uh, from the spacecraft are dried up riverbeds, uh, uh, river deltas filling up craters. There must have been um, a warmer, wetter environment billions of years ago. And uh, the only way that's possible is for there to have been a huge greenhouse effect uh, with lots more atmosphere. And everybody's best guess is that Mars has lost 80, 90, 99 percent of the atmosphere over uh, billions of years. And we used to think that uh, the atmosphere on Mars might have combined with the surface. Uh, that's actually where limestone comes from on the Earth, is carbon dioxide being sucked into the surface. Uh, but the missions sent to Mars so far can't find uh, enough evidence that the atmosphere uh, recombined with the surface. And so we're left with the other possibility that the atmosphere escaped away to space. And so that's what Maven is going to go check, is is it possible that through the host of processes we understand that the escape rate of the atmosphere to space is large enough to explain where almost all the early Mars atmosphere went. And I can uh, get into more detail about how we make those measurements if you want. But I just wanted you to give the basic idea about what Maven's about. Um, that's interesting. So, part of, part of my interest in this is I was uh, invited to come to a new media workshop out there at the University of Colorado and to to listen to you scientists talk about what Maven was all about. Um, so I'm happy to follow up with this hangout uh, for the Scientific American audience. Um, one thing that was interesting was why why didn't we sent a probe to Venus? We you know we sent probes elsewhere to look at the atmosphere, but why not Mars? I mean, that's so obvious. It's so close. But actually, what I'll do is I'll I'll actually ask Chris to weigh in on this because you've just written a book about almost every single uh, unmanned exploration craft that's been sent out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the the trouble with planetary science now is there there's so many good ideas to pursue <laughs> and so few new starts possible in the budget that you can't do everything. I was hanging out at JPL. Uh, lecturing to engineers there, and they one of them was the lead on a, a Venus mission, a Venus lander, which got deselected at the last stage when it got down to the final four. It wasn't picked, and it was really challenging because you know Venus is a pretty nasty place, and they they had a mission that was going to land there, take data for ten days before it, you know, got baked out and uh, and died, and learn an enormous amount about Venus. So you know there's there's there are missions sitting there on the sh on the shelf from NASA people and, and people who work with NASA uh, to do almost everything you could imagine, you know, whether it's Hydrobot melting through the European ice pack and looking for life or, or going back to Titan with dirigibles and, you know, sampling all the lakes or 
the more advanced Mars concepts that would actually look for life by drilling down to what we think might be aquifers underneath. You know, there, there are all these concepts out there and not enough coin to do most of them. That, yeah, that, that, I mean, with the number of things we've sent out and we've learned a lot, it just seems infinite what else we could possibly learn if we could send every dream of, you know, uh, ex explorers out there. Um, actually, before we get back to the Mars atmosphere and MAVEN, um, I, I was interested uh, when I first mentioned to my editor, oh, I you know, I want to um, talk about this book and the MAVEN thing. And your, your subtitle is The Amazing Story of Unmanned Space Exploration. And I was immediately countered with, oh, that's not, uh, you know, the correct term, the politically correct term to use the word unmanned. And I inquired uh, of you about that. So do you want to explain why you chose unmanned versus robotic, uh, despite the fact yeah, that I mean, man might upset people? To be honest, that was a, that was a, that was a publisher decision, actually. So um, they published a the book, and they, they get the deciding vote on that. So robotic would have been a better choice, I agree. Um, and, uh, you know, we've had to take the various language, look at the evolution of the Star Trek the famous Star Trek line, where no man has gone before to where no one has gone before. So there's been suitable and appropriate evolution of some of these iconic phrases. So uh, you would both of you agree that robotic is probably an, just an even better term or a perfect term, or is there an even better term? I mean, because we sent out uh, telescopes. Um, and when I think of robotic, I think of you know lots of moving arms and <laughs> things that are grabbing things to bring back to analyze. Uh, and less so uh, just analytical equipment or optics. Um, but I, I guess my expansion of robotics might need to expand. Yeah, I use robotic exploration. Okay. It, although they, they do feel quite different. I mean, orbiting telescopes or telescopes at the Lagrange point, I mean, they're just sort of the, the technology we use on Earth to observe, you know, transplanted into space. And we remote observe on the Earth. I don't have to go to Chile or Hawaii anymore because I can remote observe from my office. But um, the, I think robotic is appropriate for the planetary missions because they're literally like sense extenders. There are our eyes and our ears on a, another world and we often operate them that way. Okay, so uh, why don't um, I'll have Chris uh, give sort of a a history of robotic exploration on uh, on Mars for us, and then we'll go back and talk a little bit more about the Maven mission. So, I'm going to see you to think think back to your book, what what you've talked about, so the different explorers that have gone to Mars and what they've accomplished, maybe their uh, you know drawbacks and how we're improving on right. that. I mean, and that, well, why I was interested in that book is that I think some people just underestimate how fantastic these technologies really are that we. I mean, just setting Mars aside for a minute, the Huygens probe to soft land on a world nearly a billion miles away and then inspect it and find that it has this bizarre Earth-like, you know, lakes and weather and cryovolcanism and all this cool stuff. I mean, that's an amazing achievement. And to go back to the beginning, uh, the Viking missions, you know, long forgotten now. Most Americans were not alive when those missions were designed. I mean, they were 1960s technology. Think of computers then. Think of electronics then. And the, those, you know, two landers and two orbiters did amazing things. I mean, they did life detection experiments that have not been surpassed since, and, and one of which at least led to an ambiguous result. So the Vikings were amazing missions for that time, 40 years ago. And we've just continued the progression with uh, rovers and then, you know, NASA having gone for the bouncing bag landing mechanism, which is kind of safe, very forgiving, um, you know, up the degree of difficulty hugely with Curiosity and the Sky Crane. So, again, amazing technologies, really high risk and, and high reward and high payoff activities. Um, so, you know, these are the, these type of missions, you know, absolutely push our technology. Now, a geologist would tell you there's no substitute for bringing back Mars rocks. You know, on Earth you could examine them molecule by molecule. Um, what, but what you can compress into the something that you can launch and will survive the passage and the launch and the entry into Mars is still pretty amazing technology. The instruments on Curiosity, for instance. So I, I think you know we absolutely push the envelope of 
almost everything we can do in technology when we design these kind of missions. Yeah, Chris, if I can jump in here and, and uh, add on to this, you talk about high technology, high performance, high capability, but uh, part of the message that sometimes gets lost is that this is also low cost. If uh, you think about every image ever returned by a Cassini spacecraft or every rock ever picked up by a Mars rover, uh, uh, the sum total of all this robotic exploration is uh, less than half of NASA's budget. Uh, it's, a, it's a small fraction. Putting humans in space uh, uh, as dramatic and as forward-moving as it is, and as much as I, as much as I love that too, uh, that's more expensive. And uh, what we can do with robots uh, being so much more affordable, we can go everywhere, and we can go there now. So. Uh, that's, it was the, really the immediacy of robotic exploration and uh, our, our pervasive presence in space that makes uh, it such a compelling subject for me. And of course that advantage will just continue to grow because the, the robotic missions will become more miniaturized, they will ban benefit from Moore's Law, and humans are always going to be tricky <laughs> and difficult to sustain in space. Space is not a natural place for humans. Of that's course right. now we're sort of shading into a huge debate that plays out in our various communities of man versus unmanned or human versus non-human or robotic and, and it doesn't have to be either or you're going to be talking to Chris Hadfield and you know when the astronauts like him or John Grunsfeld who we've had here a number of times and who's a hero he walks into the auditorium and he gets a standing ovation from 200 astronomers the guy who fixed Hubble three times yeah. I mean, so, you know, there's no substitute for that either, so, but it's expensive. The space shuttle, you know, real cost was half a billion dollars a launch, and you a couple of shuttle launches buys you a really cool planetary probe, so that's a hard trade-off. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, I actually really liked your recap of the Hubble, the entire Hubble, uh, you know, building, launching, and repair in your book. So I, I, it's worth visiting the book just for that. But I, I did, I did really like that retelling. Um, uh, what I wanted to to say now that, that Chris has talked about the different uh, probes that are there uh, that we sent there. Um, of course, we know we just had a government shutdown, and this, you know, probably had you guys at Maven sweating a lot. <laughs> um, but you got the a bit of a, a, a reprieve. Uh, and they allowed you to continue the work. So do you want to explain why you guys were allowed to get that exemption? You know, uh, like sure. The NIH couldn't. <laughs> so uh, the uh, MAVEN project did stand down for a couple of days under the government shutdown. Um, and uh, we were all very anxious and frustrated by this. You know, uh, we've, this mission is ready to go and uh, it's got great science, but uh, under the terms of the shutdown, uh, that's not that's not enough to uh, to get the exemption. And even the fact that missing this launch window that I talked about and waiting uh, in cold storage for a couple of years uh, for the next chance would cost a couple hundred million dollars. Even that was not enough. But uh, what really mattered is the fact that built into Maven is a relay um, capability. Uh, for radio transmission uh, with the rovers on the surface and those uh, it's, so it's really these ongoing missions that we need to uh, preserve the capability for communication that was the primary justification for MAVEN getting um, uh, exempted from the shutdown there are a couple of satellites around Mars that are capable of performing that relay function but they're getting a little long in the tooth uh, and we needed to make sure that Maven would get there in this launch window uh, to uh, to be able to, to fulfill that role as needed. Now we hope those other missions survive, but the last thing you want is curiosity on the surface, making great discoveries and no capability for the high data rate back to Earth. So that was what got Maven uh, back on track, and we are on track for uh, for the launch on November 18th. Did I say I, I, November 18th? Yes. Yeah. I can't resist a comment that one of the, we're talking about how high tech space exploration is. One of the areas where it's really behind the curve is this communication. Um, so, from probably some of your viewers may know that Vince, Vincent Cerf, who's the 
you know, the architect of the original internet, is now working with NASA on an interplanetary internet because there's there are real problems with uh, operating the internet beyond the Earth because you have missions with hour-long transmission times and they have to look up IP addresses and they have to, you know, get hooked into the patchwork quilt that is the internet and the protocols that go with it, and there's no way to do that right now. So you know, we actually have to design an entirely new architecture for interplanetary internet, which will on which all of these space missions will depend. Oh, that's really interesting. That, that's actually really It's being pioneered by the, the mission that's, that's just gone to the moon, actually. The LADI. The LADI has been just that's pioneering some of the first transmission protocols under this new internet uh, protocol for planetary exploration. Is that built into the MAVEN 2 then? Uh, no, we don't have uh, that advanced technology. Not yet. So, um, so I, you have a picture of MAVEN behind you, and you also have a model. So uh, why, sure. don't you, why don't you pull that forward and sort of explain uh, what, what we've got going on so people have a, you know, because everyone's got, uh, you know, this idea of what, uh, curiosity looks like, right? Because uh, there are just images all the time, the rovers displayed in the internet and everything. So uh, we could get an idea of what an orbiter uh, th this type is going to look like and do. Uh, sure, and I'm glad you emphasized the word orbiter. This uh, spacecraft doesn't land on uh, the surface. Uh, we just orbit the planet over and over again uh, about every five hours or so. Uh, studying the different ways that the atmosphere can escape away to space and you know even what the atmosphere uh, properties are um, uh, high up in the atmosphere. But to give you a bit of a tour, uh, this is a 1 30th scale model and so the actual MAVEN spacecraft from tip to tip uh, is about the size of a school bus and everything that you see out here, all this real estate is the solar arrays so we gather enough uh, solar power to fuel all of our instruments, all of our control electronics. And um, uh, uh, right, uh, right here is where we keep the explosives. Uh, this is the fuel that we fire uh, as we uh, enter Mars orbit. It has to slow us down all the excess energy that we arrive there with. Um, and uh, so the uh, actual um, rocket nozzles are down here. And uh, this is our uh, relay antenna um, by which we send our own data back to Earth and also any data uh, for, uh, from the rovers when they need us to perform that function. And uh, when we talk about robotic uh, exploration, we might say that humans uh, have great, you know, five senses. Well, I, I'd have to say that uh, spacecraft can have dozens, or you can choose from dozens of different, uh, different kinds of senses when you're designing your robotic explorer. And uh, uh, Chris has already talked about how uh, robots can be the eyes and ears, and those, those analogies are really quite good. So for example, you can see we've got these antennas here, and uh, we've got some devices out on the end here. These are like the ears of the spacecraft listening to the magnetic and electric fields as they change in the vicinity of the spacecraft. Um, uh, one of the things our spacecraft does is it actually flies uh, through the atmosphere. Actually, it flies this way. That's why the solar arrays are uh, are angled like that. Um, as we as we fly through the atmosphere, we have a handful of instruments that it's like smelling or tasting the atmosphere, particle by particle. They can see what the atmosphere is made out of and even how fast those particles are going and if they'll escape away. Um, uh, my baby is uh, this instrument right here. It's the Imaging Ultraviolet Spectrograph. It's the eyes of MAVEN. And uh, you might not know it, but every atmosphere in the solar system is glowing like crazy in the ultraviolet. And uh, we have this instrument that can spread the spectrum apart uh, and see how much carbon dioxide is, how much hydrogen, how much oxygen, uh, uh, all those different ingredients, how they're distributed through the atmosphere, and even, again, their chances of escaping. So this spacecraft is perfectly designed with every instrument on board that's necessary to track all the different ways that the atoms and molecules of the Mars atmosphere can escape away to space. Uh, did I leave anything out? Did you have any questions? So actually when you're saying it's going through the atmosphere, were you saying that's towards the planet or away from the planet? Because you no. are doing, there are some dips you are uh, doing like planets. That's right. 
Um, and let me uh, let me get my other uh, prop here, <laughs> which will not be to scale. <laughs> <laughs> right, I don't have enough hands to to really do it right. But uh, to keep things in perspective, remember that a planet's atmosphere is really thin on the scale of the planet. Mars is a uh, um, uh, you know, it's considerably smaller than the Earth, larger than the Moon, intermediate-sized planet, but still the atmosphere is just about uh, 100, 200 kilometers down here. And our spacecraft uh, is designed to uh, swoop from high altitudes here down and fly, skim through the upper layers, you know, uh, uh, where the air resistance is pretty significant, and then come back up again. Uh, we're actually able to take images of the planet from up here, and then we dip back down. And every now and again, we change our orbit so that we go uh, 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 even deeper into the atmosphere. You know, it's still far above where airplanes fly or anything like that in terms of density in Earth's atmosphere, but it's a region of great interest for uh, the upper layers of the atmosphere where gases start to escape. So we call those deep dips. Nonetheless, uh, it's... it's um, uh, a pretty, uh, I, won't, I won't say hair-raising, I'll just say unnerving, this idea that every orbit we dip down into the atmosphere, there's just a little bit of friction, and we come out again. That's why we need that fuel, so we can continue to tune the orbit uh, and not dip down any deeper than, uh, than we need to scientifically. So how, uh, how long is this, uh, how long is MAVEN's, your science project, supposed to last? And then I'll get to Chris about the you know, the longevity of things, because things have lasted longer than we thought. So your project is slated to last how long? So You'll be uh, collecting data officially. Uh, the MAVEN primary mission is one Earth year in duration. We were hoping that, you know, we could, you know, slip in the fine print, change one Earth year to one Mars year, but it turns out they're tracking that. Um, but uh, one Earth year uh, is enough for us to sample all the different um, conditions of the atmosphere especially how the atmosphere behaves when the sun kind of goes kablooey. You know, I'm sure that uh, the viewers are aware of solar activity and the way that the sun can spit out extra um, energetic photons, energetic particles. Those are the processes that can strip away the Mars atmosphere. And we really want to study how the atmosphere behaves under those conditions, and we should see that uh, in our one Earth year primary mission. So there's an anticipated a major solar activity, right? That this is of concern as you guys arrive, if I remember correctly. So, uh, sun is unpredictable. We don't know uh, what the sun's going to do uh, when we arrive. You might be thinking about the comet that gets to Mars around the same time that we do. Uh, that, uh, that must be what I'm thinking of. <laughs> well, Always yeah, something going different. on in our solar system. <laughs> So uh, uh, now you will not be doing any sort of readings on the comet unless it affects the atmosphere, right? That's too soon to tell. Um, we're putting all that on hold until we're safely launched. Uh, I just needed to um, uh, uh, correct that something uh, that I said a minute ago, and that is to say we are arriving at Mars um, uh, while the sun is in a statistically active period. and that's okay. uh, So that part was correct. But whether or not there's going to be a... Uh, a good solar storm the day we turn on. Uh, we wish, but uh, we don't know. We don't know that for sure, so that's one of those things. So I, I want to pop back to Chris because, so first of all, this this area, writing this book about unmanned space exploration is not your original field of study. This is not what you prefer to do, but you're very interested. You've been allowed uh, just a lot of insights by the people you know. Yeah, he chose the wrong field when he was young. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I talked to people like Carolyn Porco, and she said it's like child rearing. You know, you've got to set aside an 18 to 20 year time span to do something like Cassini. And I'm just a bit too much of a instant gratification kind of person. I like to go to a big telescope, get my data, write a paper, and be done within six months. So it's, it's just impatience. That's the only thing. I do want to echo one thing Nick talked about, the, uh, the trajectory and the swooping in and out of the atmosphere. I mean, that's another one of the amazing the orbital mechanics of, of the people that do this in the outer solar system or anywhere in the solar system, it's pretty amazing. I mean, Cassini has, will by the end of its equinox and solstice missions, have done over 100 flybys. And they, of course, reprogram these in real time. Once you find out that Enceladus is interesting, you go back to it. Um, and I think the closest approach was 22 kilometers of Iapetus, and that's, that's incredible. And that's a billion miles away. And, 
you're swooping your billion, multi-billion dollar hardware. You yep. know, and, and don't, don't forget that this was all pre-programmed uh, weeks or months in advance because yeah. there's no two-way communication. No one's driving That's Cassini. Right. That's right. So these are, you know, these are really remarkable feats to be doing, and the people who do that, they must be having a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> yep. Just like the guy who was the deputy PI of the, um, the Deep Impact mission, you know, he was quoted afterwards saying, I can't believe they're paying us to have this much fun. <laughs> That's right. So, you know, every now and again, somebody will, will come up to me and say, oh, are, are you a rocket scientist? And, you know, I get a little chuffed. And, but then I was, I was put in my place recently when somebody said, huh, rocket scientist. I would never get into a rocket made by a scientist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you want to be a rocket engineer. Rocket, it's the rocket engineers that really deserve the credit. You know, we get to go answer the big questions, and that's what we consider fun. Uh, but, uh, boy, are we ever dependent on the ingenuity of, of the rocket engineers and what an amazing job they do. You know, I, I have to interject this. So I met a lady who uh, was an engineer, and she ended up writing a book for children about engineers. What do engineers do? Because her own five-year-old was looking at like a shuttle launch or something and said, oh, wow, you know, look what scientists get to do. And she goes, and engineers. Engineers are the ones who make this actually happen. So, uh, yeah, they're very important. So we don't have an engineer on the panel right now. we got two scientists, well, three scientists. But um, I, I don't do space stuff. Um, so, Chris, oh, I, I'd like you to speak quickly about this thing of, uh, you know, we send, uh, well, we've had a few where things have tried to give up but then sort of revive themselves, These, you know, like uh, they're able to work. But for the most part, we send these things out and they have an expected lifespan, but most of the time they seem to be exceeding that lifespan. Um, and, yeah, if you could speak on that and, like, what we can do once we've, we've gotten and lucky. That's, and that's natural and good engineering, of course. Engineers, you know, like to have big margins, and those margins are not always for a bridge or anything. It's a factor of two or three. I think in space sometimes it's even more, like an order of magnitude. So, obviously, the... The twin rovers, you know, poor Steve, talking about Mars time, poor Steve Squires has been living Mars time for a decade, and he was only supposed to do that for three months um, because the second of his rovers is still working. Uh, that's, you know, another, that's a wonderful example. The, the pioneers and the voyagers now, you know, leaving our messages in a bottle tossed into the outer solar system. I mean, they're putting out their uh, plants are reduced to a fraction of a watt of transmitted energy, but we've got big enough telescopes like Arecibo to detect that at a distance of billions of miles. And so, you know, these, again, Ed Stone, who's at JPL, you know, he's into his 80s, I think, and, uh, you know, you can... Th these missions are outlasting all of their investigators, some of them, and, that, and that's fine, because they're still returning useful data, and it's, and it's great. Um, the problem, of course, is the again, the project and the money and the funding sort of implies an ending point. And so, you know, it's, it's horrible when you face the prospect of having to switch something off that's still working or just not look at the data or not run the instruments anymore. And those are real situations because obviously you can't start new things unless you stop doing some of your old things. Um, so I, I'm going to move back. Thank you for that, Chris. So I'm going to move back over to uh, Nick about, um, so what will you do when you're past the one-year mark? It, will it depend on funding? Will it, um, uh, you know, will you still maintain, you know, the communications with the rovers on the surface or, you know, pair up with ESA uh, for future projects or what? Uh, so, uh, the one thing we know for sure after our first year is that MAVEN will be uh, uh, kept alive and operating to serve as uh, a relay for the rovers uh, for absolutely as long as possible. And obviously, um, uh, the current rovers, and there's another one arriving in uh, 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 Mars 2020. But whether or not MAVEN is also doing science uh, remains to be seen. And uh, every NASA mission, whether it's the Hubble Space Telescope or uh, the rovers after 90 days, goes through a, a very careful process where the team says, if you give us more money, here's the science that we can do. And so this is, uh, they're, they're thoughtful decisions, uh, albeit with, um, uh, with, a, with a, uh, a tight pocketbook. 
Uh, and so we'll go through that process called senior review uh, probably a handful of months before the end of our first year and we'll make the case saying uh, if you allow us to keep making measurements here's the science that we can accomplish and uh, it's a it's a fabulous spacecraft it's got excellent instrumentation on it and I'm sure we'll make a very good case uh, but it, it'll be up to a bunch of people making these these difficult choices how many uh, instruments are on MAVEN? Uh, you know, uh, the, the truth is, I can't remember if it's eight or nine, but it's it's a bunch, and some of them are designed for measuring the uh, the, the the waves and the fields. Some of them are designed for the charged particles, some for the neutral particles. We're for photons, and and some have two parts, and some have three, and so that's why I can't quite keep track. But uh, uh, basically, we have enough instruments on. Uh, they, that uh, an atom or molecule can't get away from Mars without us having uh, a handle on that process. You've noticed that. So, Chris, so, uh, I, you know, reading reading your book, uh, I, got, I got the sense, like, the average seems to be a dozen. There's at least a dozen on every probe we send out. Um, would you say that's true? Did I did I get that right? Um, yeah, yeah. The uh, a lot of NASA missions now are like these Swiss Army knives. You know, they they uh, have large numbers of instrument teams combining and, and Cassini is a classic example but these are multi-billion dollar missions. Hubble is an example, great space observatories. But, but NASA has also had enormous success with more specialized, you know, single purpose missions and my favorite two examples of course are Kepler which as its PI Bill Baruki famously said, you know, it's the most boring mission you could possibly imagine. It's designed to take a picture of the same piece of sky every six minutes for years, and that's all it does. You know, it's how dull. Uh, and then WMAP, a completely different concept, uh, a sort of microwave satellite looking at the early universe, also just doing a very simple thing, just scanning the sky over and over and over and over again, drilling down in, in the systematic and random errors to make a microwave map. And that's all it can do, but it's incredible. Those two missions, you know, hit, which cost a good fra a fraction of a billion dollars, more like 400 million, say, which is, of course, not cheap. Uh, they do one thing exquisitely well. So there are sort of two ways to go with, with all of these missions. Um, now, MAVEN, uh, there, were, there were a lot of questions about cost in the, um, in the uh, press conference yesterday. So do you remember some of those numbers, Nick? So uh, no, and I missed the, uh, <laughs> the last part of this press conference. So uh, scientists, you'll, you'll learn, uh, will remember numbers to a factor of two or so. Um, uh, but we have, uh, of course, teams of people. Uh, the engineers uh, are a little more precise than that, and the budgeteer is more precise still. Um, all I know is that um, uh, MAVEN has not raised the alarms of cost overruns. Uh, we have a principal investigator uh, who's made some hard choices, especially early on, about how we're going to keep this uh, mission from overrunning. And this is a real uh, the mark of uh, what are called PI-led missions, principal investigator-led missions, where it's really on one person's plate to make sure that this is going to perform, uh, do the science, and not overrun in cost. And uh, so we, uh, the MAVEN definitely goes in the plus column, and uh, uh, being in the university setting is one of the ways that we've really been able to keep the cost down, and we sure wish that uh, more opportunities like this would be coming down the pike. Yeah, and th so these, are, these are hard trade-offs, too, because sometimes, you know, an idea comes along that you really want to add in to your instrument suite. It gives you a new capability, and you've got to fit it under that cost curve. That the, the famous example I like is that uh, the Vikings were not originally designed with cameras. Uh, and Carl Sagan argued, he said, we're going to look really foolish if there are polar bears on Mars and we didn't have a camera to take pictures of them. And he was joking, but his point was taken. And so, you know, the, the Vikings had cameras and it's the evocative image of the surface of Mars that caught everyone's attention. And, and then fast forward to Curiosity, and this was unfortunately a failed attempt, uh, James Cameron was part of that project, and he was on the verge of having a design for an HD video camera to be part of Curiosity. He just couldn't make it under the wire of getting, you know, all specified and locked down before the launch. So Curiosity did not have the James Cameron connection. But these, keeping these possibilities in play is really important, even if it's a tough budget decision. 
Yeah. So Maven, by the way, does not have a visible light camera on it. Uh, when you think about the technology that's there for um, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, every camera has to be better than the one before. With all these other instruments uh, that we have on board, we couldn't take an even better camera. But we'll be sending back some um, uh, pretty cool uh, images and movies of the planets at the ultraviolet, and that'll be a new contribution. Not, as, not, not so many megapixels, though, so <laughs> but scientifically important. I'm actually wearing, I'll have to come up closer, I'm actually wearing a necklace by this gal who's fascinated with Mars, and this is uh, Curiosity's first photo on Mars. So she, she's taken iconic images mm -hmm. that have been taken on Mars by Viking, you know, that then she's turned into jewelry, and I love wearing them because they're conversation pieces, so uh, just my, my little uh, contribution to spreading the excitement of space exploration uh, to the rest of the world. Um, so um, let me just uh, think. Of, uh, there was a question I wanted to ask, and now, um, so Chris, is there anything else you'd like to add to this conversation of, of uh, the larger um, uh, picture of space exploration? Well, I'll just make a guess for the future, which is that we're at a sort of interesting transition point in space exploration of the, the solar system or beyond, um, or even a space astronomy, where we see this nascent private space industry, which is emerging just as well, since America can't get astronauts up into orbit anyway. We depend on the Russians, and now we're going to depend on the private sector. I think that's going to start playing out in the business we've been talking about now. Remember, there are a thousand billionaires in, on the Earth, and any one of them could fund a really cool planetary probe. So if NASA gets stuck on sending that hydrobot to Europa or going back to Titan, with the dirigible technology, um, I think uh, some billionaires might step in, and I think the whole game is going to get more interesting. It's kind of limiting when only a couple of governments are doing it, and they, the governments get shut down occasionally, and they have tough budget choices and so on. I think it'll be a more of a wild west, but there's going to be some really cool things that happen when the private sector and entrepreneurs actually start doing this stuff. So uh, here's a question. Any idea how many uh, sort of project ideas are out there and what percent actually happen? <laughs> well, it, it's a small fraction. Every time NASA has an announcement of opportunity with um, uh, sort of open categories, uh, there tend to be dozens of missions uh, for every one or two that are selected. And it's a different uh, set of dozens for every opportunity. So, you know, pretty soon that's going to be uh, hundreds of ideas that, that we're not doing. And I can't, I can't promise that they're all good or feasible with the current technology. But far more good and practical missions are not chosen uh, because the nation hasn't found the will uh, to, to fund it. Yeah. And, and I, I agree. I mean, in some competitions, you go down from 100 to 25 to 4 to 1. And the engineering, we've talked about the engineering, which is exquisite. And, and these are technically feasible. You know, that almost never is the issue of why they weren't chosen. Um, so, you know, it really is more the will, the money, the priorities, and so on, which is why I think if there are more players, you know, some of these things that are sitting there on the shelf, NASA has the designs on the shelf, will actually happen. Uh, yep, and let me uh, change uh, from the, the the billionaires that Chris talks about uh, to the billion kids on the planet, uh, almost all of whom are excited about space, and uh, uh, space is is uh, really the gateway, or I think the best gateway to STEM education and. Uh, it's really important that we keep this uh, space program going. It's now an international effort, so many nations participating, and uh, to have this uh, really excite uh, the next generation. And uh, before the viewers get discouraged about the state of affairs where we can't do everything that we want to, I want everybody to realize that everybody can play a part in this. And uh, I think spreading the word about what, uh, what NASA's... Uh, big handful of operating missions are doing, you know, if, if uh, you have access to, uh, if, if you are comfortable, go out and volunteer in a classroom. Uh, go, uh, you know, make sure your, your taxi driver or your 
uh, your your uh, waiter or waitress knows uh, knows what's going on in space. You know, this makes this part of the everyday conversation. So people want to know what's next. What are we doing? Uh, because in the big picture of the federal budget, this is not an expensive proposition that we're talking about. We just need to raise everybody's awareness uh, that this is affordable and exciting, uh, and it paves the way for the next generation. So actually, you guys will be happy to hear that I have feedback uh, from my Twitter feed and from my Google Plus that uh, we have a couple classrooms watching us right now. So uh -huh. that I am so happy that uh, teachers saw this and said, let's just share about this. Um, the, the other thing, uh, I do remember a question. Um, and to me, the answer seems obvious. But here's here's a question. So, someone on my Twitter feed asked yesterday. So why why are we going back to Mars? Why not set our sights on an already sort of predetermined Earth-like planet that's you know way out there, an exoplanet? So so why Mars? So uh, well, I'll I'll do the the why Mars again, and then I'll let Chris talk about the uh, the, uh, the 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 next exoplanet and. We're doing Mars again because what MAVEN is doing there has never been done before. There's never been a mission that is basically looking at, at uh, where the atmosphere goes. It's, we've sent a large number of missions that figure out that there was a greater atmosphere in the past, but this is just about the biggest mystery on Mars nowadays is where did the atmosphere go? And none of the operating missions can do that once so we've got to go back. And I would also, just to echo and segue, I would say that um, we, there's so much still to learn on Mars, and, and Mars is indeed potentially a habitable planet under the surface, so we, we need to figure that out. And we will always learn so much more about a planet in the solar system than any exoplanet, however nearby, that it, it just there's no comparison. However, w the what happens to a planet, because planets evolve, habitable planets evolve and change, and Mars is the great example. Um, is going to be true elsewhere too and so as we start looking at our body count of habitable and earth-like planets from Kepler and other missions um, the context for understanding them when we have very little data really we just have a size or a mass and very almost no other information our context for understanding them is still the solar system is still the terrestrial planets much closer to us yeah, but we must uh, develop the capability to characterize those planets in greater detail. James Webb Space Telescope will start to do that. Uh, but it's, it's a big technological challenge, and uh, lots of our favorite uh, engineers and designers are working on it. But at present, it's a pretty expensive uh, proposition. It's actually uh, uh, considerably cheaper for us to uh, continue learning more within our own solar system uh, than it is to learn in great detail about this, uh, the wealth of worlds that we now know are out there. So, um, okay, so we've been talking uh, so about a little over 45 minutes. Um, I would like to give both of you an opportunity to uh, express anything else you'd like to express to our audience or maybe something I completely forgot to ask um, and then we will wrap things up. So why don't we start with Nick? No, no, go to Chris. Well, go to there's... Chris. I'll go to Chris. <laughs> Well, I, I just want to echo something that we've touched on a few times, which is it, it feels like solar system exploration, study of planets is nearby, is, is a mature subject that we've learned most of what we might want to learn. And that just simply isn't the case, even with our close neighbor Mars or just a ton of questions and mysteries. And when we get to all those other, uh, the best guess is there are probably a dozen habitable spots in the solar system, mostly in the outer solar system. And we're almost completely ignorant of those. And so when it comes to going to Titan or Europa or these really fascinating destinations, our level of ignorance is, is still almost complete. So it's still early days, actually, for solar system exploration and especially in the context of, of biology and where we might find it in the universe. And if I could just step back for, for a broad perspective, um, uh, Carl Sagan said, there's one generation that gets to experience this transition from, of planets as points of light to worlds in their own right. And uh, man, are we ever getting a close look at these worlds with the latest generation of spacecraft. Uh, my, my brother is a political scientist, and he once said to me that uh, everything that I study is going to be forgotten in decades or 100 years, but this this transition uh, of humans becoming spacefaring, this is going to be remembered uh, for a thousand years. People will talk about 
this age. And so uh, for all of us to appreciate this incredible time that we live in and this opportunity that we are given to participate, uh, get everybody on board, spread the word. This is, uh, this is a real uh, hallmark of, of the age that we have the privilege of living in. It's amazing. Uh, my final question, uh, when are we sending humans to Mars? <laughs> <laughs> when I was growing up, I said I wanted to... Um, uh, I wanted to go to Mars and raise chickens to find out if they would grow larger in low gravity. Uh, and it's, uh, it's become clear to me that uh, I won't have that opportunity. I would love it uh, if uh, one of my kids had that chance. I sure hope it doesn't go down to the generation uh, beyond that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sometimes said that it's too expensive to send humans to Mars. But our nation has apparently found the will to spend that much money on other projects that I think will not be remembered in a thousand years. And I would love for this effort uh, to change the focus of our nation and even the efforts of the world to, to make that next grand step. Because I think that it is human destiny that robots lead the way, but, uh, but humans uh, can and must follow. And to answer your question directly, we're talking 20 plus years. And then again, I think the private sector is already starting to step up and make ideas. For instance, there's a well-publicized idea for a one-way trip, which obviously saves some money. And NASA, of course, <laughs> was outed on having a very similar idea sitting on their shelf, but it's not, it's not good PR for NASA to you know, to send astronauts off to die on a... Yeah, I, I actually think that the, that the space frontier will be uh, conquered by humans when humans are allowed to take the same kinds of risks that they took uh, when moving to Colorado and California when coming to the American West. Individuals uh, took risks, many of them lost their lives doing it, but uh, what the, the, the way that they opened for the rest of us, um, we we remember forever. And I think it's, uh, like Chris says, it's going to be the private sector and individuals taking risks uh, that will uh, allow us to cross that frontier. And if you want to evoke the multi-generational future, I recommend uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy, Mars, Red, Green, and Blue. Amazing evocations, not just of, of people on Mars, but of the geology and the atmosphere and, and so on. They're mesmerizing books. Well, thanks for the book recommendation because that's uh, one of my platforms. I love to get people to read. So um, thank you, gentlemen, and uh, for your input today. And, and thanks to the MAVEN team. We will we'll wait for the anticipated launch. But thank you guys for a project that's on budget or under budget and on time or under time. And you yeah. guys are just like meeting all these hallmarks and making people happy. Uh, they want to <laughs> hire you again. We That's hope. right. And uh, let's go answer some more big questions. That's right. Well, thank you very much, uh, all of you out there in the audience, for joining us for this uh, very enlightening uh, discussion about MAVEN. And don't forget, again, uh, we're looking out towards November 14th for uh, um, Chris Hadfield to join us. So if you didn't hear, his book is out today. So if you want to pick that up and join us November 14th at noon for a Scientific American Chat with Chris. We'll get more of the human side of space travel. And today, of course, we were just talking about unmanned or robotic space travel. So thank you, Chris. And thank you, thank you Nick. Bye. So long, everybody. Bye.